All right, thanks for watching, and today we wanna figure out what happens when you apply a function to an interval. So let i be just an interval, and r, so think about it as the interval zero comma one, but it could also be infinite intervals, even r of r, and also closed intervals, doesn't matter. And f of i, given a function f, is just a range of f. So it's just a set of f of x, where x is in i. So in other words, if you have an interval, a function here, for instance, f and an interval i, then f of i is just the image of i under a function f. So this is f of i. And now you have to understand, in general, f of i could be crazy. It could be a fractal set and even a Cantor set and other crazy things. However, what I want to show now is something very neat. So claim, if f is continuous and i is an interval, then f of i is in fact just an interval is an interval, or I include the degenerate case of being a single point, so, or a single point. Okay. So for instance, if you take the function f of x equals x squared, which is continuous, and i to be the interval minus 2 comma 2, then well, f of i, so f of minus 2 comma 2, if you look at the picture, like here, this is our squaring function, x squared, and let's say this is the interval minus 2 comma 2, then the range of f here, it's simply the interval 0 comma 4, but just beware, 0 is in it, because 0 squared is 0. So it becomes a half open interval, 0 comma 4. And notice in particular, f of that interval is that interval, but just be careful, uh, in this case, we don't have an open interval. So don't always think f of open is open. Or uh, the case where it's a single point is in the case of constant functions. So if f of x is always 3, then you can show that f of any non-open, any non-empty interval is just a point 3. So it could be degenerate. All right, and now let's prove uh, the fact. So proof of fact or proof of claim, I think. So let's uh, put some notation in. So let j be f of i. So again, you have this function here, f, this interval i, and the image we call it uh, j. f of i, which is j. Now, j is a subset of R, and in particular, it has, remember, what's called the infimum and a supremum. So let capital M be the supremum and little m be the infimum. So let uh, little m be the infimum of j and capital M be the supremum of j. Well, definitely the supremum is greater or equal to the infimum, but it could happen that they're equal. So case one, well, if the infimum equals to the supremum, then uh, your uh, set is <laughs> degenerate, so it's just a single point. Then J is just the point little m, and then we're done, because then the image is just a point. So the interesting case happens uh, when M is less than capital M. And here what I want to show is the following. I want to show that J includes the interval minus M, includes the interval M comma capital M. So claim 
the interval m comma capital M is included in J. And then we're done, because then what is J? Because remember, M is kind of the minimum and capital M is the maximum. So J could either be the open interval or it could include the minimum, but not the maximum, or it could uh, not include the minimum, but have the maximum. And lastly, it could include all of that. But nothing more. So uh, that's why we actually have J is an interval. All right, and now let's prove this claim. Really nice application of uh, the definition of uh, infimum and supremum. So suppose uh, C is in M comma capital M, and we want to show C is in J. Now, on the one hand, we have that C is bigger than little m, which remember is the infimum. So by definition of infimum, you're not the worst student, so there is a student that's worse than you. So there is, why not, in J, with, why not, is less than C. And similarly, because C is less than M, which is the supremum of J, we know that there is Y1 in J with, so you're not the best student, so there's a student that's better than you. And therefore, combining both things, we get that C is between Y0 and Y1. Now, what is happening? Remember, let's say you have this function here, f, and we know that y naught is in j. Is in j, that's in f of i. So in particular, y naught is in f of i, so there must be some a such that y naught equals f of a. So since y naught is in f of i, we know that y naught Again, just by definition of the range, y naught equals to f of a for some a. a and i. And similarly, y1 has to be f of b for some b in your interval. So similarly, y1 is equal to f of b for some b, b and i. But then what do we have? So that's very interesting. c, remember, is between y0 and y1. So c is between f of a and f of b. And therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, we can find some x such that f of x equals c. So by the IVT, so since f is continuous, by IVT, there is, is some x in between a and b, so definitely in the interval i, because a and b are in i, so x is in i, with f of x equals c. But then what does that tell you? It tells you that c equals f of something, where that something is in i, so by definition, that is in f of i, which is j. And therefore we're done. We assumed that um, um, C was in the interval M comma capital M, and we've shown that C is in J. And therefore we're done and we can stay home happy. All right, thank you very much.